to Shadow of Truth with your host Dave Kranzler from InvestmentResearchDynamics.com and Rory Hall from TheDailyCoin.org. And today is Thursday, March the 23rd, 2015. And our special guest today is Mr. Eric Dubin from TheNewsDoctors.com. We, we can't have any reform. We gotta, the whole system needs to be burned down. To well, the ground you know, and rebuilt, starting with the I, original Bill of Rights. Well, I don't know if I go that far. I think the original Bill of Rights is fine. It just has to be followed. That's the problem. There, there, but you've got to burn do. everything else down to the ground. I mean, it's been you know two hundred years of layering on top of layer on top of layer of nonsense, and and yeah, yeah, I hear and you. layering on top of you know legislation that undoes the Bill of Rights. I have a, a rather pragmatic attitude about that dynamic and how I would respond is that I just, I do both. I mean, there is an opportunity for in a post crash scenario, a whole hell of a lot of people looking around and going on. We had the Ross Perot movement in the 91, 92 frame because of the recession at that time and the disgruntled nature of politics at the time that woke up a lot of people and there was a third party movement. And it's possible that the pressure that comes in our, social compact falling apart post-crash could have resulted in either a third-party movement or the Republican Party getting a swift kick in the ass moving in a direction that at least is pulling us towards restoration of Republic and off this prefaces of police state rollout, endless war, you know, pushing international conflicts to use as means of uh, distraction from the economic crash to the point where we're risking nuclear war with Russia. I mean, it's just, you know... It, it, it's not a just operating. You're still operating within the confines of the current system and everything that's that's been built up legislatively. Hey you got to dismantle everything, man. Well, you got to dismantle the IRS. You've got to dis. I mean, every single government administration. I, I totally you got to just dismantle my, it completely. Burn my, it to the my ground. Only, my only point, and it's part of the reason why I'm so tired. <laughs> it's, it's not even worth do. fighting, man. This no, is just no, going to no. implode under its own weight. Uh, someone like Rand Paul, were he to be president, would be an incremental uh, slowdown in this rapid uh, rush towards totalitarianism. And I have a feeling he's captured by someone already. I, I, I also agree. agree with that. They're, they're not mutually exclusive. This is not a binary kind of analysis. It's multifactorial. And we need to buy time. We're, and that's why it's productive to push for someone like a Rand Paul, because it would provide the time for hopefully further education such that it, you sow the seeds of the possibility for some kind why of... Why buy time? I want to I wanna see this. I want to hasten what's in motion already, because what's in motion, the outcome's already baked in the cake. It's just a matter because, of how devastating it's going to be. I, I don't want to buy time. If you don't buy time and the system completely crashes and there's civil insurrection and so that's forth. That's what we and, need. That's like, what well, we that's need. what we need, but you know what, Dave? You might end up being a dude behind jail because yeah. of what you do. And frankly, I would prefer to not see I'd, civil I'd rather fight to the death. I'd rather fight to the death. I've always said <laughs> for 14 years that I've been in this, I've said if they want to come and try and take me away, a couple of them are going to die trying before they kill me. I don't care. I'm not I'm not going to I'm not going to you know, be thrown in jail for that. I'd rather, I'd rather be part of a movement that tries to overthrow this thing. Well, I, I, I sympathize with those sentiments. Find myself probably in the same kind of boat if someone were to be knocking on the door, or running through with a tank. <laughs> there's not, a, there's not gonna not be no case, knocking. <laughs> there's not a case in five thousand years of organized human history when, when um, change, change has come peacefully. It always it always goes through a period of war. Well, that's not true. Romania and Czechoslovakia and no, I'm not talking about little on countries. I'm talking about world powers. You're probably right, uh, but yeah. the thing is, is that there's a possibility for the soft, the velvet revolution, so to speak. Not with, with 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 Romania, possible. though. Didn't didn't they take the uh, the president and his wife and uh, hang them in the uh, town square and then burn yes, them. Ceausescu. Yeah. In Romania. And in that, that doesn't sound like a, a real pleasant, you know, easy transition. 
At least not no, for I him mean, and his family. No, I mean, they took the leadership out, but there, there was no civilian death at all. None. There was no arrest. They, you so know, you're talking about people. little, little. I don't even know what the population of those countries are. I'm talking about, you know, this whole Western system needs to be completely dismantled and flattened. Well, but to flatten it means death and destruction. And the bottom and line exactly, is... Exactly, and that's never, change like that's never, you know, meaningful change, you know, where you, where you completely create a new system that you hope is better. It's never happened without death and destruction, ever. It can real- happen, Dave. And, and to not do a dual-track strategy, because basically what you're talking about is you reacting once the system starts to fall apart and the boots or jack boots are walking down the street. I mean, we're not there yet, so therefore a dual-track strategy of trying to bring about education and reformation in the country is part productive, and I will just conclude... We can go round and round on this forever. It is the reason why the government is targeting ex-military as the number one uh, persons of interest on their hit list is precisely because of the fact that they're terrified of a stand down being caused by domestic police and all the agency police and the uh, vets who basically say no mas. And there are way more of them than there are active army. And if, if they're, they're terrified of this education process that's going on in the country, and I cite as you know, a great example what happened in the lead-up to the potential attack on Syria where soldiers were posing in front of their cameras and putting on YouTube pictures, no war in Syria, we're funding the terrorists, we're funding ISIS, you know, and that revolt within the military, within the, the structures of power in it of itself, is what prevented the war and changed the whole trajectory of, uh, you know, geopolitics that evolved thereafter. Now, of course, you can come back and say, well, okay, they, you know, ramped up the aggression against the Ukraine thereafter, <laughs> and you'd be right. But, you know, it, it, there's, it, it's way too early to give up on peaceable means of education and trying to prevent a total catastrophe. I mean, if this, if the country could go into a complete civil war and you'd have tens of millions of people dead. Who cares? That's what we country. need. That's what we I, need. No, I, well, I I, frankly, I, I can't say that we would we need you it, but it may happen. You can't have here, man. If, if you're going to force change, you can't have peaceful change. You can't have... When, I, when someone says dual track, I think of, oh, someone wants to have their cake and eat it too. No pain, no gain. It's, it's, it's human nature, dude. No, I can easily say to you in a counter-argument that, you know, you're squandering time that uh, can be spent to hopefully make a change that'll work. You and can't educate people. People, not enough people are going to learn until they're, until they're inflicted with an extreme amount of pain. And we're not going to have an extreme amount of pain until the economic system collapses, which it's going to happen anyway. Well, let, let me jump in here, right there on that point. Referee, please. <laughs> And I want to ask all of you guys this because that's a, that's a very valid point that you just made. And, and we were just talking about this, uh, Dave, the other day. When the system crashes and people's accounts are completely drained and the Cyprus model has been as Jeremy Stein, the Fed person, the Federal Reserve, wrote that letter two years ago, said that Cyprus is the go-forward model, period. He said that. So that is what they're going to do. They're going to go in, they're going to create a bank holiday, and then they're going to proceed to extract funds out of people's IRAs, their 401ks, and their checking accounts. And then they're going to, I believe, they're going to transfer them to the Myra. And... When, is that the, is that the point? And this is a question to all of you all. Is that is that the point where the education gets ramped up and we start seeing major change from the populace? I don't think so because, and I fall back on uh, Nietzschean philosophy, and he basically is just putting, you know iterating human nature in a pretty package of philosophical writings. And that is 90% of mankind, he's got a master-slave theory, 90% of, man, of mankind 
prefers to be told what to do. It's the path of least resistance. It's the easiest path. And then you've got 10% who are the masters and they're the ones who are the leaders and they're the ones who end up with, you know, you end up with the, the Machiavellian terrorists who are running our system. And that's, that's always happens throughout history. It stands the test of time. And even if people, what will happen is that, you know. But you just said, now, now hold on. Now you just said <laughs> that until, there, until there's a pain inflicted upon them, then they're not gonna they're not gonna do anything. And my but I don't think it's is, gonna mobilize most people. I think I think the government's basically gonna tell people, here's what we're decreeing, here's what we're gonna do. It's for national security and it's for your own good. And most people are gonna be okay. What's on TV tonight? The French Revolution hold was on, affected on by one percent of the population. I don't think we live in a world where you can have a grassroots revolution anymore because of technology. I'm gonna have to disagree with that, Eric. Sean, what do you guys think? Would anybody like to hear one minute of something that I think is very sobering uh, as it relates to the collapse, which we've all been thinking we need because then there will be a, hopefully a reset toward liberty or a move back toward libertarianism or the Ron Paul uh, way of, of operating this, uh, this government. Uh, I interviewed Corbett, James Corbett, yesterday. I think he's one of the most uh, articulate, intelligent guys out there. He's very well researched. And he's saying that the Rothschild, Kissinger, Rockefeller, New World Order has always included China in the future, and the collapse that'll happen here is purely by design to fold us into the New World Order, which is being fast tracked. And and frankly, it was the most depressing interview I've ever heard because I, I believe him and I think he's right. And so, uh, an economic collapse for us in this country is only going to make us all poorer and less able to fight back. So before before you play that, I want to remind Sean. I'll, and I will never forget this, Pastor Lindsey Williams. Think of him what you what you will. He said, "It's been what four years ago or three years ago that you interviewed him last." Mm -hmm. He said that their that their plan was to make us so poor that we are unable to fight back. So that yeah. fits perfectly with what you're. So yeah, and the only reason. Also, I'm I just want to oh. say something before you play all this. Unfortunately, uh -huh. um, the, what. I forget the name of the guy you just said who you interviewed, but unfortunately, you know, at a base level, I've always suspected that same thing. And it's been my, my, you know, human nature for optimism, hoping that China and Russia would, um, you know, would, would fight against the United States and the West and the, and the Bilderbergs. But unfortunately, if you look at the role of, you know, the, the people who are members of the Bilderbergs and the Trilats, um, it includes very prominent Chinese and I think even some Russians. Yep, that's 100% right. Yeah, and the same thing with the BIS. Yeah. And, and so I, at, yep. at, at the base level, I've always feared that that's probably what's going on. Well, and um, the problem with this clip is that it's so – he's he's so – Good. It could, I could play five minutes of this, but I'm going to try to just play you guys a minute to get a taste of it. And, and then uh, I did ask him about Russia and Putin. Does It seems to be a legitimate counterbalance to which he agreed, but he said the jury's out for him personally, and that's his next area of study, is trying to figure out what Russia and Putin are really up to. But here's James Corbett, and uh, I think it's really powerful. And what led up to this was me asking him about the shift of wealth from west to east uh, with the SGE, the AIIB, uh, the BRICS Bank. Uh, you know, is it the fix? Is it the world standing up to this tyranny? And, and sadly, the answer is no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with that. And the converse, the prima facie evidence of coordination is the West stand down willingness to let China accumulate gold That's to right. be able to be an equal player at the table. That's, That's right. I mean, it, 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 those are facts. You can see it. But, you know, I, I don't agree entirely with the thesis that you just described. And, and okay. I'll just listen on. Yeah, here, here it comes. Yay, you know, China, well, the BRICS Bank, all of these new things are coming along to undermine that. Unfortunately, it goes one level deeper than that, and that level is that at the very top of this uh, bankster pyramid, uh, the Chinese elite is connected directly in with the U.S. Uh, Western elite, and that's demonstrable. It's something that I did an entire podcast on uh, a few months ago, China and the New World Order, the transcript of which has just been posted to, uh, to my website, which documents how there there's a uh, there's eight immortal families they're called the eight immortals uh that all relate into the Deng Xiaoping uh presidency of the 1970s 
And basically from that time onwards, uh, and even before then, if you actually look into Mao and the fact that he was a Yale boy and uh, Yale and Skull and Bones is very much connected into the Chinese Communist Revolution. But even from that point, certainly of Deng Xiaoping and you have General Wang and Chen Yun and Li Xianyin and uh, Pen Zheng and Chong Renchong and President Yang and uh, Bo Yibo. All of these uh, eight people are directly nexus into uh, Henry Kissinger, David Rockefeller, um, uh, basically the, the exact same banking elite that's been puppeteering the, the rise of the West in the past century. So, I mean, and he goes on, and uh, it's scary as because there goes, you know, there goes my hope bubble. <laughs> my hope bubble has been that Chris Wayne, and it, we're all right, and that a collapse is what we need to reset this thing and get back to liberty. But in fact, the collapse is going to bankrupt us all. They're going to make us we're in a lot of trouble because, I mean, they've already offshored all the wealth to China. So yes. if he's right, we're screwed. And I think he's right because he's a lot smarter than I am. I, I think he's me? right, but my, you know, my eternal, believe it yeah. or not, for as pessimistic as I am, my eternal kernel of optimism is that. And, and what, what Paul Craig Roberts references is the, the fifth column movements in, in China and Russia, those are the ones that are connected and brainwashed by the West and tied together with the West. What I'm hoping is that guys like Putin and and the guy running China now, I'm hoping that, and they're going to be driven by sheer greed. My, my view is that human na- it, it runs contrary to human nature to share power. There always has to be one guy on top, and that's you know, and, that, and that's why the U.S. always was was fighting Russia and putting down Russia and trying to destroy Russia because the U.S. didn't want to share global power with them. And what I'm hoping is is that there's movements coming out of Russia, which would be Putin and China, which would be the guy who's leading China now. What I'm hoping is their their greed and lust for power over overwhelms any sense of cooperation with the West. Yeah. Because don't forget, I mean, it, while it's true, yeah, I think there's been cooperation between the banking elite here and the banking elite in China to, to transfer a lot of gold over to China and, and, and destroy a lot of the wealth over here. You know, to me, human nature dictates that China could turn on a dime and turn on the, on the, on the Western elites, and I'm hoping that's what happens. I've had a bad feeling just, just when you look at who's part of the BIS and who's part of the Bilderbergs. I've always had a bad feeling that ultimately there was a grand design and cooperation going on between the U.S. and China. But what I'm hoping is, is that human nature inevitably will kick in. And I'm not sure Putin's on board with, with, with whatever sort of reach arounds going on the U.S. and China have. But um, what I'm hoping is, is that human nature kicks in and, and, whomever in China or Putin decides, you know, they don't want to share power with anyone because I think that's ultimately where things head. Yeah, I, I agree with part of that. But the thing is, Dave, is that they're sharing power now because they have to share power to build themselves up in order to sustain and protect their independence at a later date. And that's the strategy that China is doing and Russia was forced to end up doing after we started attacking her more, most aggressively, but, you know, as an ongoing process, as you're well aware, uh, but most aggressively in this Ukraine stage. And, you know, the, there is a real politic analysis to this that layers on top of the conspiratorial frame of reference and looking at the bank for international settlements and trying to uh, figure out where the elites are vis-a-vis the relationships across these various cultures and then and, and sovereign states and even super sovereign relationships and so forth and there is definitely um, you know coordination and co-opetition and competition going on you know it's it's again this is another thing where it's not a binary type of analysis that leads to the greatest insight as to what these players are doing. We can see the prima facie evidence of the uh, uh, movement of gold going eastward as fact that it cannot be denied, that it could only be going on with uh, the desire of the central banks uh, in the West to facilitate China's growth, you know, in terms of possible equal player at the table. But at the same time, you know, there, China is is building these alternative systems to be able to procure their own sovereignty. 
and they have a doctrine. It's an official doctrine of regional mm. empire building, for lack of a better way of putting right. it. They want to be able to control their backyard uh, directly without the United States' ability to trump them, and that's their military goal for you know 2030. Well, doctrine. And- and, and I would agree with that wholeheartedly, and, that, and I believe that that's what's happening with all of this infrastructure that they're doing, in particular yeah, the, new, the new Silk Road. I mean, if they're coming yeah. through and saying, we're your friend, we want to do business with you, and here's our show of, of good faith, we're going to build a railroad that goes from our manufacturing centers right through your neighborhood to where we can conduct business. So. And, and like I was talking with Jason Barack the other day, you know, we were doing our interview. There's a, a huge historical difference between a, a nation that's rising and its own empire coming into force versus a nation that is an empire trying to protect the contraction of the empire. And all of the systems of the Bretton Woods 1944 agreement and the institutions that grew out of it and the financial imperialism that went on for, you know, the subsequent decades and, you know, all of that. We has been in pursuit of the growth initially until we went off the gold standard and all the craziness of the Vietnam War and everything just really kicked us off our center to the maintenance of our global power. And China looks at these things strategically from a different perspective. They make an, uh, they're building relations through business as opposed to building relations or maintaining relations through kicking the shit out of smaller countries and uh, divide and conquer tactics of uh, building up uh, factions like ISIS to go sick on uh, Assad in Syria and to try to topple Syria with uh, you know, terrorists that we fight, that we fund and, and train and so on and so forth. I mean, there's this is qualitative difference of where China is today versus where the United States is and, then, and the uh, resulting mechanics by which the uh, United States is trying to protect an empire and, United, and this China is trying to grow it and, and the different strategies they employ as a result. When I was speaking with uh, Jeff Brown, who lives in uh, Beijing, uh, a couple months ago, that was one of the points that I was making was that the United States is in the business of conducting war and China and Russia are in the business of conducting business. There is a, that's a, that is the significant difference in the two. Every time that you hear about China or Russia in the news, like, with the exception of Russia fending off the attacks that are that are coming yep. at them through Ukraine they, and they various other... They've Ukraine 50 times, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, other, other than that, I mean, every time that you hear about them, in the news, they're doing something that's positive. They're making a deal with this country. They're putting this into place. They're doing that. I mean, they're actually doing things and conducting business, whereas you never hear about the United States doing that, ever. We aren't, we aren't doing that anymore. We haven't for a long time. No, and I, wanted, I, mean, it, I, I want it, to it, ask it, you guys, hold, hold on, Eric, because I really, because sure. something that was said earlier it's, it's been gnawing at me for months, and it was just brought to the table again a few minutes ago. And it's something that I've believed for a very long time. And James Corbett said that in, in, the, in that piece, he, he, was, he alluded to this. And then, Dave, you were saying something along the same lines, except you were talking about China. I've said, and Dave, you and I have had this conversation before, I've long believed that Putin and Obama are working from the same playbook, the same as Hitler and Churchill and Roosevelt were all working from the same playbook. And that's how these things come about. And and I personally believe that that's what's happening. Now you bring in China as, as a member of the BIS and, and the trilateral commission and the council for foreign relations and all this other all this other stuff that they're involved in, it makes perfect sense. Can I and ask a question are, just to make sure I understand what you're saying? What's, I'm sorry? I'd like to ask a question to make sure I understand what you're saying. And when you were, use the phrase playbook and operating under the same playbook, are you referring to uh, employing similar strategies? Or are you talking or implying about uh, the possibility of Putin and Obama and the interests they are in? 
working together in concert but pretending or for yes, lack of a better that, way of putting that's it, what I'm that's what I'm getting at. The is that the, is the latter, and that the that they are. We all know that Obama is nothing but a puppet, and, yeah. and 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 I don't think the facts speak to that thesis. I don't think it supports it. I do, you know, clearly there's been an element that throughout history with our oligarchs have greatly enjoyed funding both sides of wars and you know, stirring up so that uh, you have justification for military industrial complex, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I get that. That thesis is valid. It exists throughout our history. This time, I think we're seeing very much a different kind of scenario because we literally had the rebooting of a, of the cold war. And, uh, you know, the, the, Desire by the political elites within the neocon establishment, in particular, are pretty explicit. I mean, these people are not interested in cooperation or cooperation with the Russians. And yeah, they see the possibility of being able to benefit from this military-industrial complex and, and all of the various ancillary stuff that links up to that, including the financial-industrial complex and all of the geopolitical power and economic power and political power that comes to that and comes to the elite from supporting the warfare state. But uh, these people, the neocons, want to literally nuke Russia. <laughs> this is part of their doctrine. They want to fight and win a first-strike nuclear-capable war as one of the possible strategies by which they can execute. That's not the kind of thesis that you have when you're trying to cooperate and build um, a kind of fake kabuki theater of regional skirmishes to justify the military industrial complex of both respective nations. So what, excuse me, so what is, what's China's role in this? I mean, are the United States and China going to work in cooperation and China's going to turn on Russia? No, 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 no. China and Russia are already forming an alliance of a, a significant stature to counterbalance what power exists in the West. I mean, that's just prima facie evidence based on what's happening. You can see it with the Shanghai Cooperation Agreement and joint military drills and a trillion dollars worth of contracts that have already been agreed to between the two nations. I mean, we're talking about a high-level strategic alliance between the two. And at the same time, China has suckered the West to play along with the uh, you know, compression of 150 years of industrial revolution growth into 15 to 20 uh, on the uh, seduction of the West financial oligarchies desire to outsource jobs left and right and financialize the world economy further and hope to build a, you know strong technology industries by uh, having intellectual property within Western geographies and financial control with labor force of the East building it and on and on and on. All of that kind of stuff that's been going on is, uh, is something that is the form of a cooperation that you can kind of point to and say, well, here's an example. And it, it actually does make sense to some extent because you got both elites kind of screwing over their general population in some respects, more so in the United States. But, uh, you know, having this growth of China to the benefit of China by exploiting the West and the West elites hollowing out our economy and basically milking that asset value and leveraging it up in the financialization process, particularly since 1973 and the removal of the gold standard, the rise of the banking system representing what initially was like 10% of GDP to 30% of the GDP, or, or certainly with respect to, I, I think I got those numbers wrong, but certainly with respect to net national profits of our sovereign firms. I mean, you know, if you look at, say, the S&P 500's financial sector representation of the share of profits, gone from, you know, 1950s to like 9, 10, 11, 12%, give or take any given year, to you know, 30 plus at the peak in 2006. Uh, and, you know, all of this kind of stuff has been motivated by all of these elites benefiting from this hollowing out of our system as we build up China. There is that kind of weird, what can be described as a kind of 
a symbiotic relationship that's almost parasitical when it comes yes. to China and the general interests of the American people and how and that whole dynamic has evolved over the last 15, 20 years, you know, beginning with uh, the Deng Xiaoping reforms, the uh, including of China into most favored nation status, yeah, and on and on. Okay. So what's Russia's role as as the United States continues to collapse and continues to and our and all of our wealth being in the form of gold continues to move into China, what's Russia's role? How are they gonna how how do they fit into this? Because if we're supposed to be setting up to go to war with them and the neocons, as you said, want nothing more than a first strike nuclear war with them, how how is that how does that fit into what you just described? Well just just a point of clarification. I'm not saying that the neocons and absolutely and necessarily want a first strike war. They want the capability of pulling that off the shelf and executing it as a strategy if they so elect, you know, as the policy makers sit around the table. So, um, you know, Russia is more of in a defensive mode at this point because the West has been attacking her. And ever since the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Wolfowitz document, doctrine, excuse me, in uh, 1992, laying out the strategy and, uh, necessity per the vision of the neocons to never let the Russian uh, bear uh, achieve a cohesiveness to the point where it could project power beyond Russia and containing it and, and so forth. And ever since then, we've gone through periods where there's been warming of relations with Russia. We expanded the G7 to include Russia and created the G8. We had opening of a much better business relations when we were able to get our cronies in with the uh, uh, Hugh Goyle scenario and Russia and, and, and Boris Yeltsin, Yeltsin's period where all of the oligarchs went crazy and you know raped and pillaged the assets of the Soviet state and transferred a great deal of that wealth to Western-based interests. Um, you know, the, the more recent period where you know, Bush... Uh, you know, would look into Putin's eyes and he said, I've, I've seen into his soul and Putin, Mr. Putin, <laughs> I don't know if talked about it, you know, he's a good guy and so forth. I mean, we've had this kind of schizophrenic type of waltz where we have leaders that, uh, like President Medvedev, who was, uh, 50 years, I think he came in in 2006 to 2008, somewhere around there. And, you know, it was a kind of an intermission between the KGB evils of, of Putin. And he was serving the interests of the West more so in uh, a, a creeping, slow-motion kind of colored revolution strategy. So, you know, we're circling all the way, full circle to answer your question. I think that we're now basically concluding that there's no reason to try to coddle Russia. Uh, some of this motivation with... Uh, uh, detente with Iran is motivated by the idea of taking Iranian gas and delivering that to the European continent in place of the loss of Russia's gas. And the, the whole setup now is basically one where the West has decided to be going full Monty when it comes to aggression against Russia. And conversely, Russia is in a very defensive mode. I mean, you know, all this talk about Russia wanting to rebuild its empire and all of this nonsense is so over the top. I mean, they, they can't even make use of their internal resources efficiently. They don't need an external empire. They've got an internal one that is laying fallow. Well, what, what do you think, Dave? I mean, what do you, what do you think as far as Russia's role in, in this extraction? I mean, if the United States and, their, and the aggression that we continue to show towards Russia, but we're supposed to be in bed with China and China's supposed to be moving in and you know, setting up shop in the United States and whatever's going to happen with us here. I mean, how is that? But it's it's all very confusing to me. It really is because China and Russia seem to be joined at the hip, but we have this aggression towards Russia, but we're supposed to be pals with China in the, you know, as far as the oligarchs and the, and the uh, shadow government that's working hand in hand in hand with the, with these folks. 
I mean, we've got to be working hand-in-hand hand with them because they, they own us. If you read the military doctrines that are published by the United States and read our documents that come out of our foreign policy think tanks and so forth, there's a huge body of interests pushing towards the creation of China as the next uh, boogeyman enemy on the scale okay. of the old Soviet Union. So, you know, the same neocons that are making war with, with Russia now are planning for making war against China five years from now. I don't know that we're necessarily in bed with China. I think, <clears throat> as Dr. Paul Craig Roberts has pointed out, I mean, both China and Russia have what's known as fifth column influences, which are, are media and government and business people who are all Western educated and, and they're in cooperation with the West. And they're, a lot of them are, are sort of tools of the United States and the West. And I think part of, of Putin's right you know, rise to power was he's he's a he's a Russian and he's he was a KGB guy and he's he grew up and was bred hating the United States and I think he's he's been over there you know fighting the fifth column there as well as fighting off the United States yeah, and I, I don't know how how the I, I've been thinking about this for a long time I don't know how the Russia China relationship is going to play out. I also think that there's, you know, the same, there's a ton of Western educated elitists over in China that are part of the Communist Party and part of the government. But I think there's also, I think the, the entity that's in control of the Chinese government right now is not part of that fifth column. And I think the U.S. is, you know, works hard on a daily basis to try and, and, and get their fifth column plants in both Russia and China to take control. I don't think it's going to happen, but I, I don't know that we're necessarily cooperating with China. I mean, we almost we almost exchanged uh, artillery fire with them in the South Sea recently. Yeah. I mean, it, and and you know, the U.S. has been trying to to take over Taiwan and control Taiwan for a long time, and and China doesn't doesn't want that. I mean, I think, I think China has its own interests that it's trying to protect, at least the people that are in power there now. And I, I think, again, I'm hoping my theory plays out that, that China ultimately does not want to share world domination power with the United States. I think, you know, China, I'm hoping China is kind of deciding that it's, it's their turn to be, you know, king of the world. So what, for me, where the interesting dynamic will be, assuming we don't, all this doesn't end up in World War III, is, is how the Chinese and Russian relationship plays out. They have a huge common fit when it comes to their respective interests, resources, cultural strengths, geography, you name it. Russia has huge landmass, 11 time zones very part sparsely populated, particularly in the East, where China is most populated. Uh, the energy scenario is a great fit because China needs Russia's energy and, and Russia needs China's uh, industrial strength to produce uh, consumer goods. Uh, China can benefit from Russia's expertise, particularly in the fields of aerospace and space in general and you know, things where Russia is just in on par with the West, bar none, and China conversely can transfer technology for industrial base to Russia um, because, frankly, the West transferred most of it to China over the last 20 some odd years. So uh, if those factors, the respective uh, common interest vis-a-vis -vis the dollar-denominated dominance and reserve currency status, uh, financial imperialism engine that comes out of the Anglo-American empire, uh, finding themselves in common uh, strategic positioning when it comes to the entire Eurasian landmass vis-a-vis uh, -vis Europe and NATO. I mean, the, the seeds, the fertile ground is there for a strategic relationship that runs uh, deep and uh, will be profound over decades, frankly. And I think that that's what's going to happen between China and Russia. Back in uh, January, Eric, you and I spoke, and, and you, at that time, you had said that you thought that there were going to be some things that, that play out uh, beginning about now, and that they would still, right. they would run through the end of uh, 
second quarter, beginning of third quarter. Are you still right. seeing that at this point? Yeah, I mean, just minor uh, variations around the theme and time frame and whatnot, but the overall window of turmoil that I spoke about with you during that call is something I continue to see. In fact, I think that uh, the primary catalyst this time around will be the financial markets within the United States uh, for this particular stage of things unfolding. Um, you know, if the Fed is able to do their one quarter hike in June, as I was saying back in that call, saying that that's a possibility because that's what they really, really, really want to do because they're trying to preserve their credibility, blah, blah, blah. Uh, in reality, I mean, they're not going to be able to do anything more than that. I mean, if they work, if they find themselves to actually execute that, then it's going to end up probably being a catalyst that'll, you know, possibly even crash the market, the stock market, 25% or something in the final analysis going into the fall. So, yeah, I mean, I think that scenario is still there. And we have such an extended uh, equity market, and, and the bond market is just ridiculously silly in terms of it, the level of manipulation that's going on there. I mean, nothing like it has ever existed in, in human history as far as the magnitude of financial firepower that's being used to execute this level of manipulation in the credit markets. I mean, that's just insane. So, you know, I, I think they've dug a hole. They can't get anywhere out of the hole, and they continue to dig further. Dave, I want to ask you I know, uh, about the housing market. We, we're getting uh, numbers again that, that say that it's imploding. And, you know, I know that you've been railing on the uh, lumber uh, market for the past couple of weeks with, with good reason. I mean, it's it's crashed crazy. I mean, it's it's just gone down, down, down for the, about two weeks now. So those two go hand in hand quite nicely. And as far as you and I have been on many, many calls uh, over the course of the past couple of months. And do you, do you think that, that the September, October time frame is in line with, with everything based on the, the housing market? Or, or what do you see in the, the housing market? Is that going to take us down completely? Uh, you know, that's a good question. Um, uh, the housing market never really recovered the way the media and the industry associations and Wall Street wanted us to believe. I mean, the first time home buyer has historically been 40% of the market of the of the um, housing market in terms of purchases, and it's it's been as high as 50%. And it's it's been I mean it's it it plummeted over the last several years to 30% or lower. And that's basically your bread and butter of the housing market. Most of the most of the balance in, in housing volume has been the, the large investment portfolios, the large investment uh, funds, and for instance, the um, and, and also individual investors slash flippers. The existing home sales. I'm, I'm still I still haven't done finished my analysis of it. I'm in the process of writing an article for Seeking Alpha, but. Um, Vacation home sales set a record in in March, and that that speaks to the fact that you know the the ten, upper ten percent of the of the population has made a lot of money in the stock market. So go out and buy an investment home, and that's and I think that's where the bounce in existing home sales came in March that the National Association of Realtors reported. The first time home buyer was still only 30% of the, of the sales volume. And the reason why their percentage went up is because investment buying continues to decline. And it's been declining since, really investment buying has been declining since the um, middle of 2014, maybe early 2014. And you can see that in the numbers. All you got to do is dissect the National Association of Realtors numbers. And, and the government's made a big push to try and make it easier for the first time home buyer and the and the you know below the top ten percent strata of the country to buy to buy a house. I mean now I mean you can if you live in certain areas that aren't even necessarily rural, 
you know, sort of outer suburban rings, you can get a 0% down payment mortgage from the USDA. And FHA and Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae have all significantly reduced their mortgage insurance fees. Mm -hmm. Under under FHA, Fannie, or Freddie, you only need to put 3% down and you can borrow your down payment. So you can essentially, if you if you've got the right people gifting you money, you can go out and buy a house with no money down and all you got to be able to do is make the monthly mortgage payment. And the other dynamic that isn't talked about at all, and this Realty Track published this data a few weeks ago and I've been meaning to write about it, but um, 35% of all homeowners are still underwater in what they call an effective negative equity sense, which means which means if you want to list your house, sell it, and move and buy a new house, you're going to end up pulling money out of your pocket. You, you, you're, you don't have enough equity in your house to cover that. And that's 35% of the country. Yeah, mortgage larger than sales price. And, and so that's, you know, so if, if you're part of that 35%, as long as you can keep, you know, if, as long as you can keep making your monthly mortgage payment, and I don't even know how long that's going to last given the quality of the, of the jobs that we're seeing that are supposedly produced by the economy, as long as you can make your mortgage payment, you're probably not going to, you know, you're not going to walk away from your house. You're going to keep it. You're certainly not going to sell it. No. And the problem with the first time home buyer is if, if, if first time home buyers aren't in the market buying homes, it means that existing home buyers who may have enough money to move up into a better home, they can't do that either because they need first-time buyers to sell their homes to. In, in terms of the new homes, homes data, I mean, it's, it's all BS data anyway um, because it's, it's, it's Census Bureau data and Census Bureau data is probably among the most corrupted of any of the government statistics that get put out when they I was reading an article the other day and there was a Census Bureau employee who was saying now now new home sales data are based on contracts signed it's not based on actual closings and essentially you know the, the cancellation rates running about 20 percent in the industry right now so when you see a, a new home sales number that's reported you can automatically discount that by 20 percent because those are just contract signings and the twenty and, percent rates can go up for two years too. Yeah, I mean, and it, and the thing of it is, the the Census Bureau never goes back and revises its data to make to take into account cancellations. So you just have year after year after year of what they call sales data that have built up and accumulated that aren't that aren't real sales. They never ended up being closings. And, and if with, they, uh, if if Census Bureau people are are taking count of of contract signings in a specific area. If they can't get a hold of the right sources in order to, to try and get numbers, they just estimate it based on housing starts. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, I, yeah. I didn't know that wow. until just recently, and I was shocked when I heard that. <laughs> it's incredible. So, so there's no telling what percentage of the Census Bureau new home sales number is actually made up. So it's, We don't know. It's actually just a, a made-up number. I mean, based on what a large said. portion of it is, yeah, a large portion of it is. So today, you saw a huge, a huge decline in in new home sales for March, which is quite shocking because we've had we've had a, a significant easing in mortgage standards, mortgage lending standards, regardless of what the propaganda from the media says. Um, March should always have higher home sales than February. And, and it went down from February quite a bit. It went down um, 11%. I mean, that's a huge drop month to month from February to March, considering that historically you should see a big jump from February to March just in seasonal pattern basis. And yeah, then they take, they take whatever number they come up with, and that, that's basically a number that's got estimates in it, data estimates in it, and, it's, and, and then they take it and they – do an, an annualization calculation to it. So what they're doing is they're taking their phony number and then producing an annualized rate. So who knows, you know, what the real numbers were. Um, now some of the home builders are for sure 
reporting an increase in closing, but not all of them. Some of them are, are, are reporting flat to down closings. And all of them, all the new home builders are reporting much lower gross margins because despite hearing about these rate, you know, the, the price rises, the new home builders are offering huge incentives in order to try and stimulate sales. And that tells you we're coming to the end game of the housing market. And yeah, yeah I do think it, it, we could we could see this thing absolutely fall off a cliff by this fall because if they can't, essentially if you look at new home sales, they're running at about a third of what they were at the top of the housing bubble. So new home sales have, have, have not even really bounced back that much since the Fed printed $4 trillion, half of it was to buy mortgage securities, since they took interest rates down to zero, and since the government you know, re re-implemented all of these taxpayer subsidization programs to try and get people to buy homes. Existing home sales, if you believe the data, have bounced back to about 45% of what they were at the peak. And so, and you want to call that a recovery and that, and that the, stim, the, the primary stimulus there has been zero, zero percent Fed funds rate and, and record low mortgage rates. I mean, the, the Fed is kind of out of tools in terms of trying to stimulate home sales. And so if, essentially, I, I think we're seeing the housing market, you know, really start to peter out again. And, and we, I think we could easily fall off a cliff this summer going into the fall. And yeah, I mean. Obviously, we know based on retail sales, et cetera, that, um, that the economy is starting to go into a tailspin. And I think we're, we're I think, you know, the, the, the one last component of it is auto sales. And obviously, auto sales have been driven primarily by subprime auto loans, which brings up a whole other point. Because a lot of people who are taking down subprime auto loans they don't have any money left over to buy a new house. Otherwise, they wouldn't be taking down a subprime auto loan. They'd be getting a just a standard auto loan, or they wouldn't even be they wouldn't need a car loan to buy a new car. They'd rather have a new car and rent than buy a house. And I think we're going to see going to school and getting a student loan to be able to put groceries on the table and to do the down payment. Well, it was kind of funny because um, one of the one of the guys on the sports radio program here in Denver in the afternoon that I listen to if I'm driving around, he was talking about when he was in college. They they he went to University of Colorado. He said they always used to share stories about you know who did the craziest thing with their student loans. <laughs> and he said, "Yeah, we had we had you know flat screen TV in a in our in our." Our apartment, we had a huge, nice apartment, and that was all paid for with student loans. So, I mean, it just it just shows you all the abuse that's going on in the system. And I think it's coming to a head. And I think I think, yeah, I think we could see we could see the real shit hit the fan in September, October time frame. I'd love to ask you a question about a sub dynamic in the real estate market. I mean, we saw companies like BlackRock do lots of purchasing of residential real estate from you know, bank-owned properties and bundling them and turning it into rental income and shoving it down hedge funds, throats, and so on and so forth. And that was a kind of demonic flywheel that was going on for a number of years that, you know, it was partly behind, actually, that bounce into 2011, 2012. Uh, I haven't had a chance to dig in and find out to what extent they're offloading or have already offloaded X number or X percentage of that kind of inventory. And I'm curious if you have been watching that. And the reason why this comes to mind is that the CEO of BlackRock was on CNBC yesterday, hinting the idea of, you know, particularly for the rich, but it was basically making the general argument that the place to be is, amongst other things, real estate. And that sounds to me like someone talking their book. Uh, what's your sense as to where the hedge funds and the BlackRocks of the world, when it came to all of that income, property, yield chasing garbage? are in that cycle, uh, and I, I know that they have been unloading. I'm curious to know where you think they are along that process. Well, um, yeah, what, what Fink said was that luxury real estate. So he's talking about, you know, skyscraper penthouse apartments in New York City right, right. or Malibu beachfront property or Palm Beach property. That That's what he's talking about. And he lumped it also in the context of diamonds and art and all that stuff. 
Right. And then, you know, obviously diamonds and art and, and, and collectibles have kept just skyrocketed in value. I, mean, I, I wasn't really asking per se about, you know, that. Um, right. Well, right. Um, the it's thing of it is BlackRock's, BlackRock's stuck. I think a lot of these big firms like BlackRock thought that they were going to be able to buy up rental portfolios, generate a huge yield on the portfolio, and then spin them off to the stock market in the form of REITs. Right. And right. there hasn't been any any REIT spinoffs from the investment funds um, that have gone public. Uh, Colony Capital, which is a big sort of the West Coast version of, uh, you know, the West Coast real estate version of BlackRock. They specialize in real estate. They tried to go public in the summer of 2013 and the, and the, and the equity market wouldn't take it. What, what, oh, yeah. right. what companies like BlackRock have done is they have issued, um, they have issued securities that are backed by flows from their rental portfolios. So in that sense, They've offloaded the risk on to people who have been willing to buy into those, you know, pension funds and institutional investors who are willing to buy into those securities. I wouldn't touch them. The reason why they can't go public is because they're not they're not renting out enough of their portfolios to generate enough enough excitement for the equity market to want to invest in it. And there there has been some of the smaller investment funds who have who have bought up portfolios are starting to sell their portfolios, but there's Eric, the market's not there for it. Now what's interesting, and I've, I've been meaning to write about this is there's been a couple of, um, there's been a couple of, of private banks, um, BBVA compass being one of them who has designed loan programs specifically for, sort of individual investors to take down these loans and buy up, buy up small mini portfolios of rental homes. And I, what I believe is that these, these lending programs, these private lending programs that are springing up are designed with the intent of giving big funds like BlackRock an outlet, right? I mean, the, the investment pattern, you know, in, in a market cycle is the smart money, the institutional money, and then the retail money. So if you if you read through the what what BBVA Compass is trying, what their lending program is about, it's essentially catering to what would be the equivalent of the retail buyer in in the in the buy to rent market. So um, and the other thing is 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 and I've got a snapshot of the flyer. Um, the Virginia Housing Authority, which which obviously is sponsored by the U.S. government, they've got programs now where they're they'll they'll give young people a zero percent down mortgage. People who are renting, they're making the Virginia Housing Authority is making funds available for people who are renting to take down a zero percent mortgage and buy a small house. And I think that's also. Um, designed with the intent of giving investment funds an outlet for their, right, right. for their, for their, for their, um, the homes in their, in their housing portfolios. But honestly, I think that, um, I, I think that the problem is just too big for these investment funds that the market's not there for these investment funds to divest. And believe me, I know the move, you know, I've, I've got articles, go articles documenting real estate industry professionals, talking about how, you know, they, they know investment funds that would like to sell, but the market's not there. The bid in the market isn't there. And it just boils down to the fact that your average American who might want to be a first-time buyer just can't afford home ownership anymore. We haven't been able to for some time now. Right, exactly. And and so um, I, I, think, I think the Black Rocks of the world are, are stuck with their holdings, and it's going to be interesting to watch it play out. I think it's going to get ugly. Yeah, it's a hell of a lot of kindling underneath the, the pile once the, the worm turns and things begin to accelerate. That's the real big danger. I mean, I honestly don't know what more the government can do other than to print a bunch of money and roll out a program where anyone who does, who's rents or doesn't own a home can take down a, a very low interest mortgage with no down payment, borrow the money from the government and buy a house. 
But then yeah. what's going to happen is you're going to screw over all of the all of the apartment REIT barons. So, you know, and that that's a whole other dynamic that's going on. And I'm especially seeing it here in Denver. And Denver's always representative demographically of what's going on in the country. There's a glut of apartment buildings that have gone up. And I have readers all over the country who are telling me the same thing in their areas. And I know in Denver, Denver went from um, a very, very tight apartment rental market to now all these new buildings that are going up, and and especially the high-end ones, they're basically rolling out the red carpet and, and, you know, you can get a free month if you move into one of these buildings, including the building I'm living in. And this was, this is literally six months after the building I'm in tried to jack rents. Couldn't do it because the market's not there. There's too many apartments that have been built. That's so, and this, this is what we saw in the, in the, in the big housing bubble. It's the same dynamic. Flippers coming in and driving the market in in terms of of homes, and you had an oversupply of rentals, and that, that led to a price collapse. And we're going to see the same thing this time around. Is it going to is it going to do us in? Is the is the housing market going to be the end of our economy? The housing market is going to when it crashes or any other catalyst for that matter completely kills the economy. It will just be gravely wounded. You know. Uh, those scenarios are more likely than the grand crash of literally everything going sub-nuclear. Uh, but it could go that way, too. Well, we've had, you know, any sort of economic strength, if you want to call it that, has been driven by autos and housing. Yeah. Well, and, of course, military spending. And, but, um, and oil. Right. I mean, the so oil is there. The, the, the oil leg of the created. stool. Right. The oil leg yeah. of the stool has been kicked out. Yeah. The housing the housing leg of the stool is about to be kicked out. And I think the same thing with auto sales. I mean, most people don't even aren't even aware of this. But um, in March, 19% of GM's reported auto sales were to the government. Yeah. It, was, it was government fleet sales. And as far as the oil, I didn't... didn't I think that someone said yesterday that we were going to, they were projecting to lose 100,000 jobs in the oil industry in the United States by the end of this year. Yeah, I mean, we've already lost 40, 50 or something like that. So that projection is likely to be on target. I mean, we likely have bottomed, barring another wave of a deflationary financial crash that spills over into the real economy and kicks the crap out of the global economy, such that the demand falls further and that we've you know, breached the 40 uh, round handle and go into the 30s. I mean, that scenario is possible. But we appear to have found some stability because the rig count has been halved. The uh, amount of actual uh, consumption uh, worldwide outside of the United States really hasn't changed that much. And the difference between growth of supply versus decline of demand on a net basis in the last year or so uh, boils down to about 1.5 million barrels worth of production on an annualized or on a per day basis in a market that's running at you know, pretty near roughly 90 million barrels per day. So like, you know, nearly... Uh, you know, one point two some odd percent or so is the difference in this marginal change of supply and demand dynamics that have governed uh, the weakening of the oil price along with the you know the pylon that went on in the futures market so the you know the manipulation and financial warfare and and so forth that were layered on top of what Saudi Arabia was doing to pursue uh, their personal interests of expanding uh, their market share to defend their market share and not do what they did back in 1986 when we had another decline and they sacrificed market share in order to support the price of oil by uh, cutting their production. And then other players would benefit because obviously you know, they, didn't, uh, they didn't take the fall for the system of the petrodollar, et cetera. Um, so anyway, the, you know, the, barring a huge downturn economically, you know, you probably don't have a, a, a significant amount of downside risk and a high probability thereof of seeing oil prices slice through 40, for example. 
So you think that they're pretty, they're they're stabilized at this point? I wouldn't go as far as to say stabilized because I think we're going to have unbelievable volatility. I mean, I think we're going to go and retest that forty, maybe and slip into high, high, high thirties, thirty eight low or something like that is a possibility. But uh, in the grand scheme of things, the lion's share of the carnage that I think has happened is definitely in the rearview mirror. If you look at the chart, even you can see that. I mean, the oil's at a prodigious bounce and Part of uh, the the last phase of the decline uh, was driven in large part by fears of running out of storage at the Cushing site in Oklahoma, you know, where the the terminus of um, pipelines from uh, Canada's tar sands and uh, just the the overall amount of storage capacity at that uh, place, uh, and which serves as the uh, hub, hub for uh, NYMEX distribution of oil in our system uh, was such that we were very seriously going to run out of storage if certain variables didn't happen. And those variables did happen. We saw you know, a, a sufficient amount of decline in terms of our output and uh, an uptick in driving within the United States in the last two months, which is the thesis of the oil market largely having stabilized at this point is probably where we are. You know, time will tell, but I, I, I think that, uh, you know, 80% of the carnage is definitely in the rear view mirror. Eric, were you, were you going to me- talk about Jade Helm at all, or um, we didn't really get to any of the other topics? Yeah, we didn't, we didn't get into Jade Helm at all. Well, I think that we could build on the conversation that you guys had with uh, Hodges and the interview you put out the other day, if you want. Uh, any other thing, too, that probably uh, touch on is just Dynamics and precious metals markets. Yeah, I want to hear about your timetable of events that you can define and serve as the final stake in the heart of the precious metals bear. <laughs> For about the last two months, I've been talking about uh, the sequence of events that would likely transpire were China to, in fact, secure entry into the SDR basket. And uh, Backing up a step before I jump on that and define what I see going forward, let's talk about what's already happened. Uh, it's very clear, uh, going back as early as 2009 and through the 2010 last negotiating period with the IMF, which they do every five years, that China was advocating to gain access to the SDR basket. And back in 2010, uh, had somewhat of a different disposition with respect to how Congress looked at the IMF, and there was more of a, a, a wiggle room when it came to agreeing to uh, elevating the representation of countries like China and Brazil in particular within the basket of, uh, well, not the SDR basket directly, but with voting rights first, and then SDR basket expansion with the inclusion of China at some point in the future. And the leaders in China, be it in their uh, university yeah, elite system, the central bankers, the Politburo people. I mean, it's been almost across the board that they've been signaling for years now that they look at the addition of the SDR uh, to include the renminbi as a uh, step of advancing the progress of China ultimately in the long run, 2030, somewhere maybe even a little bit before then, 2025 securing the status of the world's primary reserve currency. And it also is true that they're not necessarily even targeting primary uh, in the near term and that they'd be perfectly happy to have kind of like a multipolar world when it comes to reserve currency status uh, above and beyond uh, you know, the typical way people would describe that when it comes to geopolitical power. So, you know, when a lot of people would, you know, hear the theory and thesis of Jim Rickards and then look at Jim Rickards' uh, very clear background with intelligence connections and therefore being skeptical of his perspective and whatnot and, and then concluding ultimately that China wasn't going to go in that direction and that uh, was, you know, basically propaganda from the West and whatnot. The missing piece to the analysis of analysts that proffered that thesis was that all you'd have to do is look at what China was openly talking about in all of these various uh, centers of their power infrastructure when it came to how they saw themselves five years forward in the monetary system. And here we are now at a stage where 
the headlines are now in the rearview mirror that prove that that thesis is correct, that they are, in fact, going to most likely be added to the SDR basket in the uh, September October time frame of the IMF meeting. And, but in order for them to become a bona fide member of the SDR basket, the IMF provisions call for a greater liberalization of their capital account um, to also uh, see more internationalization, participation, and use of the renminbi on a worldwide basis. And on the latter, China has definitely done that. They've achieved that by executing what must now be somewhere in the neighborhood of about 28 bilateral currency swap relationships and direct trading relationships. And uh, you lay on top of that the AIIB and the, uh, uh, the new development bank, this rather weirdly named thing that <laughs> it's literally the new development bank, quote unquote, which used to be known as the BRICS bank and on and on. I mean, they, they have achieved uh, a monumental increase in terms of the renminbi being used as a transaction currency for the movement of goods and services worldwide, uh, going from less than 1% uh, 10 years ago to now on the order of being the second most used currency for those transactions of goods and services clearance worldwide. So they meet the criteria on that respect with res when it comes to addition to the SDR basket. They're a little squirrely when it comes to the capital accounts, as you know well, Dave. I mean, you know, their markets are not open. They're not free. The, the renminbi is not freely convertible, and it's traded in the managed float band and so on and so forth. But I think that they've achieved enough uh, of power uh, for and respect and confidence for the renminbi, given all of these bilateral relationships and the massive growth in its uh, uh, trade, such that they're going to be able to muscle in with the IMF. And we've heard somewhat like two weeks ago, Christine Lagarde, the president of the IMF, saying that, quote, it's going to be a matter of wit, when, not if, end quote, when China would come into the basket. Germany has, has said the same basic thing, and China's leaders all the way up to their premier has said the same thing. And uh, so I think, you know, this is only a five-year cycle. I mean, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen this negotiating period. So all of that said as backdrop, uh, in order to finally earn the uh, heft and respect and trust of the RMB and its addition into the SDR basket being viable, they're going to want to increase the confidence behind their currency. And in order to do that, the easiest way to do it is to just up their estimates of gold that they hold. They're probably, in my opinion, going to come in somewhere under 4,000, and that they're going to probably announce this somewhere in the June, July time frame, and uh, that they want to be above Germany in terms of Germany's declared holdings. You know, never mind what's supposedly stored at the New York Fed vault and all that good stuff. And uh, you know, not reveal the full extent of what they hold in terms of gold, obviously. So sub 4,000, but well above Germany, somewhere in that 3,500 to 4,000 range is what I anticipate and expect them to announce. And when that happens, also, it is going to break out in the gold market because all the bozos at the World Gold Council and all of those people that follow them on Wall Street, I mean, the, the conventional financial world, uh, representing 95% of managed money, has no friggin' idea what the heck has been going on in China with respect to how much gold has been taken down. And when the 4,000, some, or, you know, just shy of 4,000 number is announced, it's gonna blow the minds of the conventional finance community and the bozos on Bloomberg will be scratching their heads, pulling in analysts saying, what the hell happened? They won't be calling Chris Jansen. <laughs> 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 but, you know, this, this has a sequence that's predictable, and that is really the take-home point. Uh, you know, I think that it's almost a 95, 90% probability that this IMF FCR basket is going to be uh, rejiggered in the fall. And as a result, that requires China to come out and make their declaration of gold holdings, or at least vastly increases the um, you know, rationale and, and logic behind you know, biting their tongue and making that declaration at that time because it has a, a payoff of being able to get them into the FDR basket. 
so all of these things, um, you know, are lying before us. I think that even the massive rally that we've seen in Chinese uh, A shares and, uh, and it's partly driven by a realization that uh, after a pretty long bear market in the stock market, I mean, the Chinese uh, retail investor was paying only attention to real estate and ignoring the stock market. So that certainly played uh, a major role in setting the stage for this giant move that we've seen in the Shanghai index. But part of what the, the craze that's going on in terms of money flows into China, I think, is in part a recognition of the rise of economic power. So anyway, I think that this fall is going to be setting up the stage for a sequence of events in the summer that will uh, drive the gold price higher. I mean, it's interesting that this meme, this way of framing what may happen is beginning to seep into the commentary that I'm beginning to see in other places. I think it was Nomura that came out with a report on April 8th talking about this very basic sequence. I mean, you know, maybe they're listening to the Silver Doctors program for all I know. <laughs> <laughs> James Dirk the other day was on King World News talking about how that it's at some point in the late fall, uh, winter frame after the SDR negotiation and all of this, that we're probably going to hit some kind of an air pocket uh, that will be directly created by the shifting um, uh, gears of the international monetary system as the dollar begins its decline from 60% reserve assets for you know the reserve currencies uh, and and the bonds and so forth that are held by central banks and sovereign wealth funds all over the world to what in my opinion and I'm not you know saying this is what 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 Turk had described but you know ultimately dollar falling to 45% uh, reserve as a currency status utilization, and maybe even as little as two years. So all those kind of things will reduce the purchasing power of the dollar at the margin and put a bid under gold, and I think part of that cycle will begin to start being priced into the market this summer. Do you think that China is actually going to announce that they have quadrupled their holdings? I Somewhere do. in the neighborhood in the 4,200s? Three to four range? times. In north of Germany and below 4,000 is my window. And you think that's going to blow up the gold market? Not blow up, but put a bid under it. I mean, it'll it'll help. I and mean, frankly, I think we're all we will see a bid already in the gold market. And then it may very well be starting within this you know week. For all we know, I mean, every <laughs> we go through this cycle every time in the latter stage of this bear phase where you, you get some renewed interest by the paper jockeys and they start chasing the you know gold on the comics gold in the lbma gold in the etf and the, and the mainstream financial world where 95 plus percent of managed assets uh, wake up and they buy gld in january and put in the peak in the gold market in january to january 22nd and we had 500 million dollars worth of gold editions, at least if you take the numbers at face value, um, you know you never know with GLD and all of the <laughs> shenanigans that go with their inventory and whatnot. That's highly probably going on, but you know they added fifty five hundred million dollars worth of gold to GLD because of these paper guys coming back. And I think that part of what neutralizes the cartels uh, urinating all over the gold and silver markets during periods of time is in fact this ebb and flow of the return of the paper jockeys. So I think, you know, the the paper jockeys are probably gonna start coming back into gold because it's such a depressed asset and you know, there's so much liquidity flowing around that people in uh, at the margin will begin to put on their value hats and chase something that's been obliterated. You think the same thing's gonna happen to uh with silver? Yes. But gold will lead because this is driven by monetary crisis of possible reset in the future, and uh, gold having the dual characteristic historically of being a fantastic asset to hold in term in, in periods of, of grave deflation, which is you know something that people like Terry Dent and so forth don't really recognize and for whatever reason don't understand monetary history. But gold performs as a crisis asset not only in times of inflation, but also in times of deflation. So I think the probability of gold, 
you know, serving as a kind of like a trampoline underneath uh, the precious metals market in, in, in Toto uh, will play out. And, you know, once it starts, once the bull market starts, then that's when gold, when silver starts uh, really doing its traditional 3x uh, performance, 2x, 3x performance over the price of gold on a percentage basis uh, throughout a, a bull period. Do you think that once... The uh, once the bull takes off, do you think? Do you foresee it turning back any any time in the near future? Like, it could be a, it literally today. <laughs> no, I mean, no. I, I mean, as far as when, when things oh, you mean getting things hit back shake down. out? Yeah, exactly. When things shake out and start start coming into light, do you see it? Do you see the price moving back down significantly, or is it just gonna? Is it going to reach a plateau and kind of stabilize? Well, in the final analysis, I think we're going to have a reset of the price because basically the central bank, you know, Dave mentioned that the central bankers have run out of all their tools. It's one tool that they haven't run out yet because they haven't used it yet. It's the end game tool, and that's the reset. They reset the price of gold to some silly high price, and uh, that uh, re liquefies the central bank's balance sheets and the financial position of nation states and you know that's what will happen at some point when is really hard to nail down yeah i think that that's probably 2016 uh maybe 2017 you know and it really will ultimately depend on whether or not we have an intervening financial system crash because if we have a full-blown deflation crash or domino style derivatives blowing up all hell breaking loose kind of thing then that accelerates the time frame in which a reset is mandatory. But if we have a uh, Catherine Austin Fitz slow burn kind of thesis operational where, yeah, we may have a 25% at worst case stock market correction crash in the summer of, of which the Federal Reserve and all of the various central bank monkeys in return uh, you know, fire off their bazookas and we have the very last QE. <laughs> <laughs> it blows everything sky high. It, I mean, that even might not even work, frankly. I and mean, I think, if I'm not mistaken, David Stockman has that thesis as his operating um, model as to what's going to happen in the year forward, where the, something is going to serve as a catalyst that crashes financial markets. The central bankers are going to respond with hyper liquidity, and the markets at that point are going to say, whatever, we don't buy this bullshit. You've already. Uh, gone through massive QE that created no recovery. Everything's falling back down again in terms of a deflationary uh, uh, flywheel crash that's got its own momentum. And we, this time around, we just are not buying it. We're pushing interest rates up because we want compensation for the risk of taking on your garbage debt. And if that happens, and the confidence gets kicked out from underneath to the support of the credit markets, well, you know, that, that creates... The, that, that, that lights the fuse of the bomb that takes down the system. And uh, in that scenario, you're, you're talking about an acceleration of the global reset with a high, high, high probability of gold being introduced as uh, uh, some form of an underpinning of backing currencies. And for that matter, they, you know, like Jim Rickard's thesis of the SDR being the global liquidity pump, quote-unquote, uh, that would replace national central banks and their direct QEs, and then instead what we might see is the, the IMF serving as a, a new issuance of SDRs to float the liquidity of the world. I mean, who knows? There's so many moving parts here. Yes. But, uh, you know, at least in the near term, I think for the first time in the many, many months, I think I can put my finger on what is a very viable scenario and chain of events linked to this whole quest by China to become a member of the SDR basket. And it makes sense in terms of what they need to do to make that happen. And it fits along with a time frame like we were discussing back in that call, I guess, in January or whenever it was when we last spoke, that um, there's you know this window of turmoil related to the excesses of the equities market and the credit markets being so unstable because they're so overvalued. They are highly overvalued. You, you've mentioned Jim Rickards a couple of times now, and he has he 
he's holding on to the seven to nine thousand dollars an ounce for gold. Do you see that as more of a of a uh, trade value, or you know, it'd be a floor. Well, I mean, I mean, once the reset, you know, yeah, well, maybe uh, I didn't understand your question, so we well, reset I, it. Yeah, let me, because uh, I need a second to get this all out. Um, he's talking about seven to $9,000 an ounce for gold. If that is at the trade level, you know, nation to nation, then I can get behind that. What is going to happen at the retail level? I mean, because if, if things, if things kind of blow up and the derivatives all ignite and just burn the whole system to the ground, I don't really yeah. think that I don't think that they're going to allow us to use gold. I think that they'll either put a tax on it or, yeah, you know, yeah, that, they, that will completely ban it. And then you know, China trades, China will send us goods if we send them gold, or China will do business with you if you send them gold, or the SDR is going to be backed by gold, and you have to bring gold to the table. We have to see it, and it has to be audited, and it has to be a assayed. So, yeah. or am I, is that is that something that you're seeing, or is that about right, or or what's what do you see as as far as me being able to use gold in the future? It, it it's a risk factor. I mean, I even think about that myself personally when, when it comes to my own precious metals holdings. The reality is that. Uh, the government can be very aggressive with excess profit taxes, quote unquote. They could outright make illegal the you know, ownership of gold once again. The you know stuff that they're doing when it comes to uh, you know, cracking down on pawn shops, gun shops, and using the uh, instruments of the state to uh, go after so-called uh, disfavored businesses is the same kind of stuff that they can do to coin shops. It wasn't all that long ago that there was the prospect for uh, the Obamacare first law to incorporate the mandatory requirement for the issuance of W-2s when, or excuse me, 1099s, when somebody would sell as little as $600 worth of precious metals at a coin store. Yep. And then the coin store would have to file that with the IRS and that everything would be documented. And all of that was being proposed because, well, in part, they justify it with the same kind of broad brush strokes of, well, we want to control crime. We don't want people to have the ability to launder the value of jewelry that they ripped off from your grandma last night when they broke into her house. You know, I mean, that's how they, they frame this kind of stuff. But in reality, the bigger picture goal that they were after was putting in place the institutional uh, mechanisms by which uh, to execute capital controls. Exactly. Uh, and, and that, I think, is coming. I think that there will be that kind of thing going on in the bullion space. Just the other week, we were talking about that on SD Weekly Metals and Markets, and I made the point to everybody, keep your receipts. <laughs> I mean, if, I if you that. buy an ounce of gold at fourteen hundred bucks, and they put in capital uh, excess profit taxes, and they say, "Okay, now you got to pay seventy percent or whatever," just pulling a number off the top of my head, I'm not making that forecast. But you know, if, if you got your basis value at fourteen hundred, it's a lot less painful than if you have the IRS saying, "You buy, you don't have a receipt." Well, I guess your basis is zero, and therefore, what you sold it for, your revenue is your capital gain. Thank you for the seventy percent of your five thousand dollar transaction per ounce. So keep your receipts, folks. I mean that's important. And they also make the case too that you and I have talked about a couple of times, Rory, and that's that there is a place for mining shares in the hedge and diversification that one should have vis a vis this insanity that's coming down the pike because mining shares are not the same thing as owning, you know, GLD, paper asset, gold title. You're owning a percentage of a company that has the reserves that are in the ground and the ability to monetize that in terms of cash flow on the other side of a currency reset. So whatever kind of currency they, is the regime that's put into place in various countries, uh, you will be generating cash flow in that new paradigm. And owning the mining shares outright and your physical possession or at the corporate registrar as opposed to E-Trade, Schwab, what have you, in street name, uh, will 
uh, ameliorate the risk to a very large extent of an MF Global style crash where the the own the company uh, squander their assets and then you think that they can go in and reach and grab yours to uh, pay for their mistakes. So there is a definite uh, solid logic and and case to be made to own a significant amount of mining shares of very high quality companies. Uh, you don't necessarily have to go crazy with risk and go to the juniors and so forth. But you know, for share insurance and uh, the ability to transition to the other side of this monetary event, this transition, mining shares are probably going to be the asset of choice and actually the easiest way to transition versus holding physical bullion. And, you know, people in the precious metal space, particularly those of the ta- of the stacker mentality, hear that and it gets their cackles up. I mean, they just don't like it. <laughs> I recognize that. Um, and I can't, you know, convince everybody to see the rationale and validity of the argument I'm making here. But I think, uh, I think people who just look at the basic interest of seeking diversification and flexibility of options against and uncertainty of parameters you're going to face in the future. I mean, you just can't predict exactly what the insanity of governments can bring. So uh, The only thing you can predict is that they are insane. They <laughs> are. You can, you, can say that with, you can say that with 100% surety. Yeah. And what you can also say with 100% surety is that whatever you think is probably not going to happen. It's probably going to be the opposite of that. Yeah, yeah. So well, if you yeah. think that that things are going to be are going to continue to be all rosy and you know rainbow spewing unicorns, that's probably not going to be the case. <laughs> so, I mean, just my two cents there. I mean, they, we know that that we know that they're crazy and that they do not have our interest at heart whatsoever. And that whatever they can do to steal your wealth, they are going to do. And so it is our job, it is our responsibility to have these conversations, to teach one another how to better protect ourselves, and to to present different scenarios so that we are able to find the scenario that better fits our particular situation. And with that I'm very grateful for you bringing that back to the table Eric because you're one of the few people that will say that's willing to say you know owning paper is a good thing and here's why and then you explain yeah, well, well thanks for thanks for coming on Eric well my pleasure yes and someday maybe we should talk to you know drills and the roots of all of that because it's a great subject and not a lot of people know about that whole history going back to the 1960s civil unrest creating incentive for the military to uh, and organs of state and the deep state to set up it's not yeah and you know what would be an absolutely rocking addition to that discussion would be uh, Frank Morales he's been pushing and researching in this area for 30 years if not more and uh, yes. his understanding is phenomenal. Yes, yeah. and yes. I mean, uh, if we could, you know, if you can get him for the early part of May or something like that, or just any time, whatever's convenient for yeah. his. May, May is early enough for it to be of great value. Yes. Uh, vis-a-vis the window in which the majority of these drills are apparently being scheduled in the, you know, well, it's it, 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 it doesn't. No, it doesn't launch until July the. Tw- it launches July fifteenth. It runs from July yeah. the fifteenth until September the fifteenth. That's the official window. Based on what um, the guy I know here, who's he's seen, you know, paratrooper drills in in the southwest sur- suburbs. It's kind of a more of like a semi sort of rural areas right up against the foothills. I think they I think they're doing pre training drills for this thing. Yeah. What's going on right now. I mean the other day I posted yeah. on the news doctors a video feed that uh, had somebody capturing on their iPhone uh, something like twenty uh, National Guard troops walking through a town and doing drills of urban combat and Yes. 
you know, it's, I, I, it's already going on. It, it is going on. Idea. There was, there was uh, go over to uh, the Daily Coin and look at that video that I posted yesterday from uh, Yuma, Arizona. It's it's part of the that interview, and it's it's only about thirty seconds. But they have a freaking massive helicopter to land in what appears to be a park in Yuma, Arizona. And they're out just talking to citizens with their weapons, full, full gear. I mean, it is terrifying. And what you were talking about, Eric, that was in Ontario, California. And right. that was, uh, you know, it's, it's those kinds of things that are happening and they're happening all over the place. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous and they are, they're just conditioning people to accept the fact that the military is going to be in your face from now on. That's what, that's what I see anyway. Yeah. And then, I you know, agree. The, the contingency ability to pull off the shelf, the, uh, you know, takeover of the Boston, the takeover of New right. Orleans with yes. uh, Katrina those are the one-off examples. And then the master plan is the ability to do it nationally. Yeah. Anytime you have the sufficient catalyst, be it financial crash leading to, you know, riots in the streets and so forth, or something related to, say, for example, the idiocy of the neocons and the Ukraine go completely over the top. And the fog of war and the unpredictability of war leading to a chain reaction that ends up getting us into war and a conflict directly on the ground with Russia and all hell would break loose domestically in that scenario. I mean, geez, we're, we're sitting here now with unbelievable levels of propaganda to the point yeah. of, you know, 90% of the American people thinking that Putin invaded 50 times or whatever. And uh, the level and extent to which the domestic gears of uh, propaganda and surveillance suppression is going to turn over to hard core police state uh, on your face if we ever get into a major conflict. But if you go to the war front, like, the domestic you know, conditions are going to turn the pot ugly fast. But, you know, I, I think this is a great subject. We should dive into it in, in much greater detail than what we're doing now. Yes. And in large part, frankly, because though I think that Hodges has uh, the correct analysis when it comes to the role in which the FEMA camps play and the whole crackdown against domestic insurgents and domestic uh, persons of interest and, and people that, that is the deep state targets, particularly veterans and front callers and all that stuff. Right. Um, I, you know, that whole thesis I think is correct. I, I want to stress that I'm not knocking him because actually I respect his overall analysis, I think he puts his finger on a lot of things that are correct when it comes to this element and dimension of the domestic apparatus of repression. But his analysis as to where the domestic apparatus of repression fits into the overall context of the geopolitics fighting and the risk factors of ISIS on the border and Russia coming in. I mean, that there are huge holes in his analysis, and I'll just give the audience a very simple very crystal clear example. He describes how Obama is the Manchurian candidate and how Obama is the socialist communist in terms of his worldview. All of that being true. But his thesis goes further to suggest that because of these inclinations of the person of the man in the White House, who frankly is a puppet and has far less power than what uh, Hodges is ascribing to, the the dish rag in chief, as you call it, <laughs> that was just a heck of a line. I was busting a guard listening to that. I mean, that's it, what it, he it, is, man. He's a dish yeah. rag. Yeah, I never heard that before. It was a great phrase. And, and, and if you've coined it, then by all means, we need to enshrine that forevermore. But you know, here he is saying that Obama, because of his you know communist leanings and whatnot, he's uh, open to doing. Uh, it's the dirty deep business behind the scenes with Russia to bring in 15,000 troops per the FEMA uh, agreement that was, I believe, signed in 2013, if memory serves, and that, I'm oh, sorry, 2010, I think, as he had mentioned. But in any case, the, the contradiction between that and simultaneously saying that we are going to go to war with the BRICS nations in the summer is just bizarre. I mean, you know, OK, 
okay, so we're going to go launch a war against uh, Russia, and simultaneous to that, because of domestic uh, turbulence going on, because we had a financial crash or what have you that motivated our desire to launch the war, I mean, to go hot as opposed to this behind-the-scenes subterranean uh, financial war that's going on live now and hot uh, between Russia and, and the United States directly, and then the proxy war within the Ukraine. I mean, if it spins out of control, we actually have a direct confrontation with Russia. You, you're going to tell me that Russia is going to be allowed to put 15,000 troops into the United States to facilitate uh, domestic repression of dissidents? That there's a hole in the thesis and it deserving of further analysis and reconsideration of one's assumptions and the connection of dots that one makes. And I think Hodges kind of it makes some rather major errors in his conclusions about the nature of Russia as a threat, as a primary aggressor who's interested in quite literally even invading the United States. He made that case that Russia is you know, seeking to do the Red Dawn scenario and even hooking up with ISIS and using as one of his dots that proving his or, you know, substantiating his case and his thesis that this recently uh, discussed and discovered base per what uh, contacts and sources to Judicial Watch have uh, revealed to the media. I mean, you know, there, there's a lot of holes in his analysis, and uh, we can dive deeper into that. And, and it, it's beneficial in one very big respect, and, and therefore worthwhile discussion, and that's that it helps neutralize this overall narrative which this whole thesis about transmuting Jade Helm as but one more example of the red threat uh, that, you know, it's contributing to this cacophony of voices of propaganda about we need to fear the bear, we need to have Russia as the grand enemy, or that rather that Russia is the grand enemy and that we need to fight them. Uh, and address them in the theater of Ukraine, and on and on and on. And the neocons' wet dream of being able to actually uh, cut at the root Russia's ability to become a nation that can project its power beyond its own borders. Going back to the Wolverine's doctrine, you know, the doctrine that we were speaking about uh, earlier in the call. Um, this this whole zeitgeist of dumbed down American understanding of this needs to move somewhere to what happened like what you know, preceded the months leading up to what would have been our attack on Syria. The attack on Syria was neutralized because you had soldiers posing in front of their uh, webcams and putting on YouTube and Facebook and so on. I will not go and serve uh, to fight terrorists were arming. And messages to that effect were all over the place. We had a, yeah. a, 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 a veritable mutiny in, in cyberspace that scared the crap out of the powers that be. And, you know, it, it, that's the same kind of sentiment that led to the fragging in Vietnam and, and on and off. I mean, they just, they, the powers that be knew that they wouldn't be able to control their own military. Yeah, if you can get uh, Frank Morales, that would be awesome. And if we could do that sometime, sometime in May, that would be incredible. I'm game. Yeah. That'd be a good deal and, right there. And also, just as a parting shot to folks out in your audience, I'd say go to Google and put in quotation marks, Frank Morales, and quotation marks, Garden Plot. Garden Plot was uh, originated in 1968, and it was the progenitor of all of these various civil uh, insurrection countering programs that are coming out of the deep state. And the roots go back to that period. And in order to understand what's going on now, you really need to wrap your brain around the genesis of, and plans that were put into place back then and how it evolved to Rex 84 under Oliver North in 1984, where they uh, formally went to another period of pulling out of mothballs, uh, military bases, and you know, using the justification of, well, we're in a war in Central America uh, with our proxy Contras fighting the Sandinistas, and that's uh, creating turmoil where refugees will possibly flow in over the border and swamp uh, U.S. cities to the tune of you know half a million people or whatever. That was the lie that was put out to justify the need to uh, resuscitate all of these military bases that became part and parcel of the FEMA camps under X-84, 
and you sort of heard the same stupid justification. I think it was like memory serves around 2004, 2005 when Halliburton came out and said, "Guess what, guys? We've got a contract from the U.S. government to build FEMA camps, and well, we just, we need to do it because we're being overrun by immigrants." Yeah, well, well, you know, we could see more. <laughs> <laughs> U.S. government. Well, if you close the border, then... about immigrants. <laughs> you find them, you know, plane tickets to fly them in. <laughs> hey, uh, hey, dudes! I hate to interrupt, but I got a three o'clock appointment. Well, we've been speaking with uh, Mr. Eric Dubin from thenewsdoctors.com. And Eric, tell them a little bit about what you got going on over there. The newsdoctors.com is a news portal that covers lots of different subjects and spend a lot of time in particular hand selecting things with respect to finance, precious metals, geopolitics, and uh, our specialty are those three subjects in particular. And anyone can follow the work that I do uh, by going over to the site and on the right side I have set up various names, including Dave Kranzler, including the Daily Coin and myself, Eric Dubin. You can click on any of those buttons and pull up uh, the content that we syndicate from you guys and as well uh, anything that I do when it comes to interviews or stuff over at the Silver Doctors with our weekly Silver Doctors uh, market wrap. That's all indexed under my name, so you can follow my work. I just want to add, it's a great website. I love the way the home page is formatted, and there is a ton of information on there. Yes. I would concur. Yeah, and when our RS feeds come in, I mean, we're literally syndicating all of Zero Hedge, for example, and, and people know how much Zero Hedge puts out. And, and we quite literally have Zero Hedge and then everything else that we're layering in on top of that, plus the... Um, original articles that we produce and syndication of great stuff like what Dave puts out all the time and you, Roy. Well, thank you very much. I certainly appreciate it. And well, I think it's been a great show. I think it's a wrap. That's a wrap. Eric, we will talk with you soon. It's been a pleasure, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Talk to you later, Eric.
little bit about what you got going on over there. The newsdoctors.com is a news portal that covers lots of different subjects and particularly is able to do that when we have our feeds running from RSS, but that's not working right now. <laughs> but uh, I spend a lot of time in particular hand-selecting things with respect to finance, precious metals, geopolitics, and uh, our specialty are those three subjects in particular. And Anyone can follow the work that I do uh, by going over to the site. And on the right side, I have set up various names, including Dave Kranzler, including the Daily Coin, and myself, Eric Dubin. You can click on any of those buttons and pull up uh, the content that we syndicate from you guys, and as well as anything that I do when it comes to interviews or stuff over at the Silver Doctors with our weekly Silver Doctors uh, market wrap. That's all indexed under my name, so you can follow my work. I just want to add, it's a great website. I love the way the home page is formatted, and there is a ton of information on there. Yes. I would concur. Yeah, when our RS feeds come in, I mean, we're literally syndicating all of Zero Hedge, for example, and, and people know how much Zero Hedge puts out, and, and we quite literally have Zero Hedge and then everything else that we're layering in on top of that, plus the... Um, original articles that we produce and syndication of great stuff like what Dave puts out all the time and you, Roy. Well, thank you very much. I certainly appreciate it. And uh, Dave, is there anything you'd like to add? Nothing I can think of. Well, I think it's been a great show. I think it's a wrap. That's a wrap. Eric, we will talk with you soon. Been a pleasure, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Talk to you later, Eric.